Alrighty folks, welcome to video number one in my lecture series. I uh, just got email from the uh, Grand Valley. We are now officially online for the rest of the semester, uh, including final exam it looks like. So uh, anyway, this will be what it will be, I guess. So uh, again, just to kind of remind you, uh, last time we left off, we did the uh, the soils part here uh, and all of our groundwater as well. In fact, if we look at the third bubble, did you notice that third bubble? It's super tiny. It's right there, right? This is all the surface fresh water that we have on our planet. That's it, right? I mean, it looks like a tiny, tiny little dot, but that includes all our rivers, all our streams, all our lakes including our great lakes right here themselves which is one-fifth of the entire world's fresh water uh, surface fresh water supply so between this bubble which is all of the world's fresh water liquid fresh water and all this liquid surface fresh water we have removed all the groundwater so the vast majority of the fresh water we have on our planet is groundwater but again this tiny little bubble hopefully it is striking to you how little surface fresh water there is on our planet because fresh water is very important to us as humans uh, we use it almost exclusively for all of our endeavors not just drinking and showering and bathing but for most of our commercial and industrial activities as well we use almost exclusively fresh water so moving in talking about streams a few definition out of the channel and into the floodplain. So in an area like the Grand River where we have a nice big wide floodplain, uh, once it gets out of the channel, the water has to spread out over the floodplain and then it will start to rise, right? So as it comes out of the channel, it goes out over onto the floodplain, right? And that is our, when we get into flood stage, when it comes right out of the, the channel. Another term uh, uh, for uh, 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 streams is overland flow. Uh, overland flow is any water that, that flows over the surface of the land into a stream uh, or creek or brook, right? A stream is any of those, right? And it also includes this, this kind of subsurface storm flow here, right? Which is just, you know, it's not really groundwater. It's not part of the, you know, the water table. But uh, when it rains, some of it soaks into the ground and via gravity will, will uh, uh, rush downhill and eventually make it into the stream. Uh, so that is one thing that adds to the stream. We also have direct interception, which is any water that you know, directly intercepts the stream. There's not going to be a whole lot. It's going to gain, obviously, a lot more water uh, during a storm uh, from this overland flow and the subsurface flow as, as stuff flows downhill into the stream. Uh, in areas like, like Michigan, where we have actually a fairly humid environment, we have lots of water, groundwater's everywhere, it's not that deep, right? We actually get a groundwater base flow into the streams as well. So uh, in times when uh, it hasn't rained in a long time and you go to that little uh, neighborhood creek and there's still water in it, the reason there's still water in it is because it's actually gaining water from the ground, water is seeping out of the ground into the stream bed itself so groundwater base flow can add to streams uh, in these in areas like we have here where it's uh, nice and humid and we have lots of water right? so that's what's going into the stream what's coming out of the stream is known as stream discharge and this is the volume of water moving through a channel right in a given time so how we calculate this is basically area times velocity so we'll take a bunch of measurements and figure out the cross-sectional area of the stream itself all right and then we'll take a little flow meter we'll stick it in the stream and we'll measure the velocity of the stream so let's say we we did this in meters or something right now let's do feet feet is, is uh feet per second cubic feet per second uh, discharge is something you're always interested in if you're you know whitewater rafter or a kayaker canoeer or fisherman so we'll, we'll do cubic feet per second so let's say we, we calculate you know the, the the square feet here you know one direction times two directions is length times width that gives us an area in square feet and then we stick our little flow meter in here and we figure out how fast the water is moving in feet per second we multiply those two together and we get cubic feet per second right you could do the same thing in cubic meters per second or however you want to do it 
Right. Like I said, here in Michigan, the uh, the groundwater is actually fairly high. We have lots of it. Uh, there's water everywhere. And in our case here, in, in these humid climates, you know, we're not, you know, tropical rainforest or anything, but there is lots of water around here. If you have home wells, you know, you don't have to dig them very deep before you hit water. Uh, anyway, so we have what are called gaining streams, and this means that the water is actually soaking in from the 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 groundwater into the stream. So in other words, the water table is above the level of the stream, so groundwater flows into the stream. In arid areas, such as, you know, out west, Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, uh, those places are, are so dry, the water table is so very low, that whenever you have water in a, uh, running through a stream, you actually are giving up or losing water to the ground because it is sucking it in. All right, so here the water table is is, per, is uh, adding to the stream. In arid areas, the the uh, the stream is actually losing water to the ground. It gets just sucked into this bone dry ground. Right, and in fact, a lot of streams uh, out west and in arid areas are known as intermittent streams, and intermittent because they only flow when there is a storm event occurring. Another important term to define is a drainage basin. Uh, drainage basin, watershed, these are completely interchangeable terms. Uh, you can use one or the other, it does not matter. Uh, they refer to the land area that collects water for a given stream, river, lake, ocean, what have you. So in looking at our diagram here, here we have this, this red area. All right, and it is separated from this blue area by by a topographic high spot. Remember, we talked topographic maps uh, before in lab. So this is a topographic high spot, and in other words, a hill. This is the the crest of the hill. So here it goes down that direction. Here it goes down that direction. Same thing on the the other borders here. So basically, if you are a, a drop of water and you fall or rain or land in anywhere in this red area, you will become part of the drainage basin or watershed of this stream. However, if you happen to fall into the blue area, you would become a part of the drainage basin of this watershed or, or stream, right? Drainage basins can be defined on any scale uh, from continental down to the local little creek running through your backyard. It just met, it really depends on what you're studying. So if you're interested in looking at the health of the entire Great Lakes ecosystem would be silly to look, you know, individual little stream by individual little stream, right? Uh, on the other hand, if you want to look at, say, PFAS contamination in Rockford by Wolverine Worldwide, uh, you wouldn't want to focus on, you know, the entire Great Lakes or even um, Lake Michigan drainage basin. You would simply want to look at the Rogue River drainage basin, which is the local river right there. Uh, in Rockford where all the contamination uh, happened. Right. The other term to define is drainage divide. So here's a drainage basin here, here's a drainage basin here. This topographic high spot that separates the two is known as our drainage divide, right? So again, drainage divide, just like drainage basins, get defined on any scale that you're defining the drainage basin or, or watershed on. So if you're defining a watershed on a continental scale, use continental size drainage divides. If you're dividing, uh, looking at the one in, in you know, the little uh, creek in this, uh, the park next to your house, you're gonna look at you know, where, where the topographic high spots, where those hills that separate these different drainage basins uh, occur. A few more terms to, uh, to define when we talk about these, these drainage basins and eventually drainage networks, which is how drainage basins link together and how water flows. Uh, tributary, of course, as we're familiar with this term, this is the smaller of any two merging channels. Headwaters, these are the upper part of the, the drainage system or stream. At the other end, we have the mouth. So this is where the, the, uh, the system ends, the stream ends. Uh, it will either end into an ocean, a lake, a pond, another stream usually, right? So uh, that is the mouth of the, the stream. Again, drainage divide, just to remind you, that topographic high spot, a hill, a mountain, a valley, whatever, separating two drainage systems. 
in a drainage basin, which is also known as a watershed. And again, this is the land area that collects all the water for a given stream or river or lake or ocean or however you're defining it, right? Again, because drainage divide and drainage basin can get defined on any scale you need. It just depends on what you're studying. So here's a, a, a picture of a nice tributary, right? We can see here is the main branch stream, at least in this this uh, this photo, right? So here would be like a, a first order tributary, the first one coming off. Here's a, a second order tributary, third order tributary, right? And it's about all we can see from here, but there'd be fourth order and fifth order. And who knows, maybe if we zoomed out, maybe this, uh, this stream itself would even be a uh, tributary to an even larger uh, drainage system. Once again, to remind you, we talked before about the difference between weathering and erosion. Again, weathering is essentially the rotting in place of material. Erosion is the removal of that rock material and soil from its original home. So first it weathers, it rots in place, and then it is eroded and transported away. Now streams can only erode their beds where the water is actually in contact with the stream, that makes sense, right? So the stream here can only erode where you see water, right? Only where that water can uh, uh, is touching and moving debris down the down the uh, um, down the river channel, right, or stream channel. So they erode their beds through through the the processes of abrasion, sandblasting, chemical weathering, end up picking up loose debris. Uh, but we know that you know if this was just streams just eroded their beds simply by um by uh, uh by uh, um eroding their or if streams grew simply by eroding their beds right you just you know stream channels would be super tall super skinny and super narrow but that's not how it happens right uh they widen their sides via mass wasting which of course was the last chapter and we didn't really talk about that hopefully you did that in the smart books though and mass wasting is simply the the um, movement of material under the direct influence of gravity. So basically crap falling off the sides, falling into the water and getting carried away. This is how it widens the sides of its banks. Another very important term to define here is base level. The base level is the lowest level to which a stream can erode. And this is usually a body of water. So you're usually talking an ocean, a lake, another stream right so wherever it dumps into another stream remember once we come out of this channel right so when it's channelized energy is channelized once it comes out of the channel right energy dissipates when energy dissipates sedimentation occurs so basically when saying this the lowest level to which the stream can erode when you come out of the smaller uh, the stream into whatever larger body of, of water you go into, right? You dissipate your energy and you cause deposition rather than uh, erosion. There is another important term to define, which is ultimate base level. An ultimate base level anywhere is sea level. This is the lowest place to which water is trying to get. Right? Even the water in the Great Lakes here, ultimately it flows down into uh, the ocean. Right. So uh, but, you know, that has to go through all the way through the whole drainage network of the Great Lakes. Right? So here's an example. We have a, a nice natural stream here coming up from the mountains down into sea level, ultimate base level. Right. But then uh, what happens if we adjust the base level? In a couple of ways we can adjust the base level. We can have sea level rise or fall. We can have land level rise or fall. Or we can create, you know, a lake or a pond or a dam. And by creating a dam, we now create a new lowest level to which this upper part of the stream wants to cut down to. So this upper part of the stream no longer is trying to reach all the way down to sea level, right? It's trying to reach to the level of that reservoir behind the dam. So once again, it comes down this, these streams here, right? And then once it comes out of the channel, energy dissipates and sedimentation is deposited or is caused right so we start depositing sediment right left alone eventually these reservoirs would all fill in from the back and create a new nice profile right but again having this uh this new base level 
uh, higher has adjusted this. No longer does it have to go down to sea level, it only has to go down to here. And that is going to adjust the entire profile of the stream uphill from the reservoir. Right. Now, base level, I should say, right? Ultimate base level is sea level, but lots of times we, we look more at a local base level. And, you know, around here in Michigan, rather than going for sea level, a great ultimate base level is our Great Lakes, right? Here in West Michigan, uh, our, our good, I'm sorry, local base level is, uh, is our Great Lakes. So here in West Michigan, right, a good local base level for us is Lake Michigan itself. Lake Michigan, like here on same, same level, right? Same lake, if you don't believe me, drive over a bridge we have up north. A few more definitions when we're talking about uh, uh, the, the uh, water column in a stream. First of all, bed load. This is any debris that is bouncing, rolling, pushing, sliding, right? It's gotta be in contact with the ground. It's being moved, There's the, the stream has enough energy to move it, but it's not being picked up in suspension. That is called the, the suspended load. This is the lighter materials you're talking silts, clays, uh, and organics, uh, and ions that are in solution, the ions we get from chemical weathering. Right. A little bit closer roll, uh, look at this, uh, this uh, um, uh, water column here. Here's our dissolve, or our bed, bed load in the bottom here, sand, gravel, boulders, whatever's being transported, right? And that does it through several methods, saltation, one of my favorite words, which means bouncing, right? Sliding, rolling, and then we have our suspended load, silts and clays, right? And also, in our suspended load, the, the, uh, the dissolved ones. These are our ions, again, our, our ions in solution that will become part of chemical sedimentary rocks at some point. A couple more terms we need to define as far as, as streams. Uh, and these are kind of, uh, they sound kind of similar, but they're uh, actually quite different. Uh, capacity, this is the maximum load of solid particles a stream can transport. There's nothing to do with the size of particles, just how much stuff can be transported. Right? Not the size, not talking, you know, boulders or, or cobbles or anything, but, but just how much stuff. Right? And the higher the discharge, the greater the capacity of the stream. So basically, capacity is related to volume. The larger the volume of the stream, basically, you know, discharge, the larger the, larger the capacity of the stream. And this differs from competence, which is the maximum size particle that can be transported, right? Faster flows, larger particles. So competence is related to velocity. Now, if we think about it, uh, a little mountain stream has a lot of competence, very steep. And if you look at the, uh, the, the stream bed there, you'd be seeing, you know, boulders and cobbles and, and, you know, large particles, maybe some sand stuck between those particles, but mostly large particles because it has a large competence. It can transport big pieces, right? The Mississippi River, on the other hand, has a huge capacity. It has a huge volume. Now, it not, may not be moving, you know, boulders. It's moving more sand, silts, and clays, so it doesn't have as high of a competence, but it's a lot larger capacity. In other words, that little mountain stream has a higher competence than, say, the, uh, the Mississippi River, but not nearly as much capacity. If you added up the whole weight and volume of, of everything being carried in there, the Mississippi River is definitely transporting a lot more material. It is important to, uh, to note also that in any circumstance for any given stream, the greatest amount of erosion and transportation, the greatest capacity and the greatest competence all occur during flooding times. Let's go ahead and cut this video off right here. Uh, we'll pick up next time. We'll start talking about deposition uh, and uh, stay tuned for that video coming soon.